Like, why am I not welcome? My story includes detained, searched, interrogated, covertly surveilled, lied to, humiliated, and physically assaulted. If and you know what is my problem? Well, my problem is what's happening to me is happening to millions of Americans, but what's happening to me is just at a higher level. The FBI is illegally, immorally, and unconstitutionally spying on me, and it's damaging my life. China, Russia, yes, they're threats. We got threats everywhere in the world. Remember Saddam Hussein was a threat? Yeah, relax. The number one threat, the American globalist government and the American globalist corporations. I left in 2007. I think the FBI is overrated. Same thing with the CIA. We could talk about it. Incompetent, immoral, and I left. And I never want to go public. 2007, I wrote a letter to Senator Chuck Grassley. Never should have wrote that letter. Senator Chuck Grassley sucks. He should be fired. I wouldn't give to this country at all. And so I don't recommend young men serving in the military. If you want to do it, do it. But I, I don't recommend it at all. How any military officer could have, we'll just say, you know, the, the campaign in Afghanistan on his resume and be proud as a West Point graduate, our mission is to win wars. We absolutely lost in Afghanistan. We didn't even know the mission, but guess who won in Afghanistan? Guess who won in Iraq? The general, because they got their promotions. 2010, I left America. This relates to the story and the bigger leadership picture. America is going to collapse. It's going to go to civil war. It's going to go to revolution. He then shakes my hand. He's trying to squeeze it, trying to break it, trying. And then I asked him the second question. I said, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? Now he's pissed off. He's like, no. At that time, he rotates his, uh, his elbow. I'm tall. I'm six foot five. So he's five foot nine. So, you know, there's obviously a height difference. He elbows me in my solar plex, shoulders me in my chest so hard. I almost fall down. He almost fall down. And we spin 180 degrees. Now we're in 180 degrees. We're now about, because he lost his grip after he hit me, we're about, I don't know, two meters apart. Around. The grip is done. I know this person's FBI. You don't want to get into any physical altercation with this. And it's surreal. Let's talk about leadership in the military. I have a very, people ask me, why did I leave the army, the military? Why did I leave the FBI, which is very prestigious? And why did I leave America? One reason, weak men. What's going on, folks? Welcome back to uh, Beyond the Beret. Today I have, now is it David? Do you go by Dave or which one do you prefer? All right, so today I have David on the show, a uh, former Army officer at West Point, and I wanted to bring him on uh, to share his story with you guys in hopes that somebody watching this gets something out of it, right? So, uh, David, before we jump right into your story, I'd like to ask a couple of questions right before we start, um, just to give the audience a better uh, picture of who you are. Um, now, when it comes to books, uh, last book you read and what was it about? Interesting, probably a long time ago. I, I probably one of the best books I ever read was when I was in high school. It was called The Outsiders. Obviously, we should know it. It's the a movie, The Outsiders too. But it's uh, it's a great on leadership, on boyhood, on society, and sometimes it's sad. It shows a American society of what it once used to be and no longer. So I recommend that book, Outsiders. I think it's an American classic. Gotcha. I'll have to write that down. I haven't read that one. Or, or watch the movie. Obviously, the book is usually better, but they made the movie and it's filled with a lot, you know, Tom Cruise, all these stars. But in school, we had to read the book and it always uh, impacted me. The Outsiders, which out of the blue, I'm thinking about it now, but that shows a lot about the American patriots right now. We're, we're sort of feeling like we're the outsiders in America. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Yeah, the, the movies typically don't do the books justice just like uh, starship troopers like that was like once i read that book um throughout my entire military career i had every single new guy that shows up to my team it was mandatory reading for them and then you watch the movie and it's like it's it it, it does it just doesn't do it justice so i get it um next one for you if you had a time machine and you can travel 
anywhere within history uh, to change one major event, what would that event be and why? Interesting. Um, probably relates to a lot of politics now. I'd probably say World War II. I don't believe that American people, we know the truth of what happened in World War II, and it's so endemic. Obviously, I'd probably go back even further, though, the biblical times with Jesus and everything like that. That's probably would be a, a better answer. But obviously, I'm speaking politics and leadership right now. World War II is still constantly repeated in politics. I'd like to go back there and see if I could find the truth. I don't believe we, we, we know the truth of what happened in World War II, just like we don't know the truth of what happened in 9-11. Yeah, that seems to be the theme as it relates to these uh, military conflicts that that we get thrown into. Um, I was interviewing a, a gentleman the other day, and he said something that made sense. He was like, whenever old men disagree, the youth and the poor, that's who goes and fight these wars that they send us to fight. Like, whatever dis disagreement Putin and you know Biden might be going through, instead of sitting down and hashing it out like, man, they send... Americans' kids <laughs> to, to go figure it out, right? And, and again, I, I come from a, a strong leadership perspective. So if I could add in on that, because again, I just sporadically said World War II, but I come from a Jewish family that immigrated to America in 1850. My Jewish grandfather volunteered in World War II. We're all volunteers to fight against Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. If he would be alive today, which I'm sure many of World War II of veterans, if they were alive today, to see how this corrupt American globalist government treats American citizens and military veterans and his Jewish grandson, I don't think he would have fought in World War II. So that's what I'm saying. I don't think we know the whole truth in it. Just like me as a West Point grad, I'm not going to fight and die in any more of these wars for this corrupt government. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that. Um, and then last one, and then we'll jump right into your story. Now, you mentioned that you're a vet. Um, as a veteran, if you could change anything about your military career, uh, would you change anything? And if so, what, what would that be? That's a tough question. I I'm very proud that I'm a military veteran. I've said it many times, graduating West Point is the greatest accomplishment of my life. I think West Point is a, is a second-rate academy now, You meaning I have nostalgia of the military, but I, I would say if I changed it, I would, I would remind military veterans, ultimately, our job is to serve the American people. We are the freedom fighters, the defender of the constitutions, and I believe we are mercenaries of the government. We serve the military-industrial complex. Like most people don't know, President Eisenhower, who is Jewish, by the way, who warned us on the military-industrial complex. So maybe it doesn't maybe answer your question directly, but to kind of remember what my oath is to, the, to defend the people not to defend Boeing and Raythe, you know, Raytheon and Lockheed Martin. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for answering that. Um, and then with all that said, uh, David, we'll jump right into your story. If you don't mind, just tell the audience who you are, um, where you went to school, military service, and then we'll jump right into what's going on with you. So my name is David Baumblood. I was born and raised in New York. I come from a long line of military families who fought from the Civil War on. I graduated from the United States, from the United States Military Academy, West Point. One claim to fame is I'm the 12th person in the history of America. I only say this to military veterans because I think civilians, they, they wouldn't understand it. I'm the 12th person in the history of America to earn a dual commission. I was commissioned by Army ROTC. I graduated school in Alabama called Marion Military Institute, Army ROTC. Then I went to West Point, and I graduated West Point four years. So I graduated both, uh, earned, my, uh, earned my commission, served five years in the military as a U.S. Army officer, entered the FBI in 2004 as a special agent in the National Security Branch, working foreign counterintelligence. I left in 2007. I think the FBI is overrated. Same thing with the CIA. We could talk about it. Incompetent, immoral, and I left. And I never want to go public. 2007, I wrote a letter to Senator Chuck Grassley. Never should have wrote that letter. Senator Chuck Grassley sucks. He should be fired. I don't, I'm not a supporter of Republicans and Democrats. Also, a claim to fame about me. I'm a China expert. I know more about China than probably anyone in the United States government. 2010, I left America. This relates to the story and the bigger leadership picture. America is going to collapse. 
It's going to go to civil war. It's going to go to revolution. I predicted this in 2005, and I left America in 2010. Now, I left to go to China. You can go to any country you want. You know, you pick and choose. I'm fluent in the Chinese language, and I went there. And I think to kind of, you know, hit on the story, because there's probably so many questions about me, but one thing you could, uh, you could do that's pretty interesting is I'm a military veteran, and we look at enemies abroad. My very first video that I posted on YouTube, and you could go, it's already been censored. So we don't have freedom. So basically, I'm on Rumble. And, you know, what is my problem? Well, my problem is what's happening to me is happening to millions of Americans. But what's happening to me is just at a higher level. The FBI is illegally, immorally, and unconstitutionally spying on me, and it's damaging my life. I'm not even welcome back in America. And we'll explain it. That right there, it sounds the most ridiculous statement you ever heard. An American citizen, military veteran, not welcome back in America. And to everyone listening, I never wanted to go public. I wrote a book, and I, I, I was not interested in this. Before I went public and everything, I contacted the FBI. I said, we need to talk. Stop spying on me. They ignored me. I wrote the Inspector General of the Department of Justice. I said, we got to talk. I've got serious allegations. They ignored me. Then I wrote every single congressman and senator for over a year, constantly. I've been ignored by everyone. Then I still wasn't going to go public. I was just never going to travel back to America. That's it. Because you can't, you can't mess with the FBI. It's like, forget it. I'll never go back to America and go on my life. Then the FBI started spying on me overseas, destroying my life. Then I decided to go public. But it's a key question. It's like, you know, why, why did you write a book? Well, you know, why are you here? The FBI got to the point where they'll never stop. And, I, and the only thing the FBI is remotely afraid of is public opinion, but it's got to be millions. But here I am censored on YouTube. I was suspended on Twitter. I've got a new account. But I, I say to the big, and there's a lot to my story, but to the American people know this. China, Russia, yes, they're threats. We got threats everywhere in the world. Remember Saddam Hussein was a threat? Yeah, relax. The number one threat, the American globalist government and the American globalist corporations. Who took away my freedom on social media? the american government the american corporations but it just we'll go into it jay i know you got a lot of questions tell me where i go but that's really the gist of my story and that is my life is being destroyed like a lot of americans are but it's gotten to a level that it's it, it, it's th this is now intolerable it's time to go public and tell my story and the thought that i'm censored on youtube and this it just shows again to the american people our freedoms are a joke and 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 it's the government that's taking them away yeah, yeah, definitely a lot said there, and we'll unpackage a couple of things. So the very first one that I want to talk about is patriotism. You mentioned that you come from a line of individuals that serve in the military. Um, talk to me about what you think is the reason behind your lineage and everybody within your family tree serving, um, and where do you see that going today? Yeah, so... And I'm not going to, I don't recommend service anymore in the military. So I'm probably the last in my generation. So that's a key thing. Why did every, and my father. So let me tell you this story about growing up with my father. My father and my uncle never got drafted to Vietnam. They volunteered and they made it known. They never got drafted. I grew up as a child. We had some draft dodgers, you know, in our town. I'm sure a lot of people met some Vietnam draft dodgers. And I called them cowards. I said, you're unpatriotic. You should have went to Vietnam. And my father admitted Vietnam was screwed up. We shouldn't have went in there. But he said, David, sometimes as a man, you can't pick and choose which war you go to. You can't say, well, I'll go to that war, but I'm not going to go to that war. Your country calls you and you go, even if you disagree. That was old school America. Now, if there was a draft, so when I say America is going to collapse and people say, what's your statistics? Just like we probably say World War II is probably the best generation in America. You know, they answered the call to draft. I don't believe we could do a draft now. And if American men refuse to go into the draft, I think they're smart. So back to your question, why did I do it? You know, the, the motto of West Point is duty, honor, country. And I believe that for a man, I'm very traditional. We'll talk about feminism and the, there's many reasons why I'm censored, but I, I specifically look at a man. Your job, your duty is to serve your nation first, and then 
yeah, reap the rewards, get rich, you know, live a good lifestyle. But you could say, my father's a very successful entrepreneur. He's made a lot of money, but he's a military veteran. He served his country. Meaning you first give to your country and take from your country. You know, it is. But now I wouldn't give to this country at all. And so I don't recommend young men serving in the military. If you want to do it, do it. But I, I don't recommend it at all. Now, as far as the collapse in the Civil War, you also mentioned that, and I'm sure you watched it develop. Like, what do you think is the cause behind all of that? Sure. So remember, I'm different than other people. I predicted this in 2005, and I physically left America in 2010. So it's not like I'm new on this bandwagon. And when I said Civil War, Collapse, Revolution, 2010, people looked at me like I'm nuts. I think people are starting to think otherwise. What is the main reason why we're going to collapse? There's many reasons, but I'm going to simplify it. I'm an American citizen, military veteran in China. And there are Chinese dissidents who left China and are in America. And me and them are saying the same thing. You Americans are communists. It's interesting because I'm in China. Oh, by the way, China's not communist anymore. It's fascist. It's national social. We'll go into that later. But I'm telling you, America's communist. And now this goes into your question, how we're going to go civil war. It's very simple. Let's compare the Western world with the non-Western world. In the non-Western world, the government has the power. The Chinese government, the Russian government. I'm not saying good or bad. Just go with my logic. They have the power. In the Western world, the corporations have the power. In China, you could be a billionaire. If you go up against the Chinese government, it's over, people. So the governments have the power in the non-Western world. In the Western world, the corporations, the banks, the money, that's where the power is. Our politicians work for them. That's difference number one. The difference number two is, in the non-Western world, their ideology is nationalism. It ain't communism. It's called nationalism. Our ideology in the West is called globalism. That's what these corporations are. They're globalists. We work for the globalist corporations. So Common Sense 101, you cannot have a nation long term where your superior ideology is globalism and not nationalism. We've been seeing this for decades. I predicted this in 2005. Sooner or later, globalism, which is very similar to communism, is our ideology in the West. Whether you know that, whether you don't, whether you disagree or not, in the long term, globalism will destroy the nation. Whereas in China or Russia, they are nationalists, not communists. They are nationalists. Sooner or later, and we'll unpack this more, but America's done for. You're going to see it. We are going to hit an economic collapse. That's probably on par of the Great Depression. And to your point, Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, I think he went against the Chinese government. And I haven't seen him in like a year and a half. Right. Um, and I think it's an interesting point you make when it comes to um, the corporations, because we all know and we can you know, turn a blind eye if, if, if we want to. Money makes the world go round. So when there's money involved in things that it's not supposed to be involved in, whether it's the military, government, people are going to be bought. And I, I see it happening at every fucking level, the corruption. And it's not, especially within the military. Like I am, I spent 20 years in this military and I know politics in and fucking uh, 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 corporations don't have any place in it. Because as soon as you inject that, guys start losing their shit and they start betraying their oath for money. I'm going to give you an example on leadership. And oh, by the way, I went to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. That's the, and trust me, Harvard's overrated. The, college is overrated. I don't even recommend college anymore to kids. But anyway, the Harvard Kennedy School of Government has the most amount of alumni of all politicians, Democrats, Republicans at the national level, state level. That is a political machine. The Harvard Kennedy School of Government, people go there to run for politics. Even me, I was thinking about running for congressman. To make a long story short, had a class running for politics. The professor said, number one question, what does it take to become a politician? Answer, how much money can you raise? 
That's the difference between China, believe it or not, and they're corrupt. I'm not saying they're not corrupt. But in America, the politicians, Republicans and Democrats, they work for the same donors. Because if you're going to run, you're going to have to raise millions of dollars. And none of these political donations are for free. These corporations give money and they expect you to serve the corporations, not the people. Let's talk about leadership in the military. I don't have a very, people ask me, why did I leave the army, the military? Why did I leave the FBI, which is very prestigious? And why did I leave America? One reason, weak men, beta cuck men. You cannot have a strong country when you have weak men. I'm not impressed with the military leadership. And I specifically look at the officer corps and especially the generals. I describe them as weak men. And let me show you about leadership, about the difference. Leadership in a nation is found in the military and in the business world. It is all about economics and security. Trust me, this is the same in China, the same in Russia. In order to become a strong country, you need to be militarily strong and economically strong. You find your leaders in the business world and in the military. But I just said the leadership is horrible. We have become horrible because we become corporatized. And follow this line of logic. It's very simple. You have military generals now that are corporatized. They're yes men. So now if you have someone running to be the president of the United States and he says, hi, I'm general or admiral so-and-so, I think generally 99% of them suck. There could be some anomalies. I don't know too much about General Flynn. I know he's part of the Trump team. Could be anomaly. We probably agree on the FBI, you know, his feelings in the FBI. But generally speaking, admirals and generals, they're corporate men. They are no longer warrior leaders. They are no longer doing this for duty on our country. They're corporate men. The same thing in the business world. If you said, hi, I'm going to run for president and I'm the CEO for Coca-Cola. I'm the CEO for IBM. Corporate men, they suck. So where now is the leadership in the business world and in the military? Personally, I think in the business world, it would be small. Hey, you know, Jay, you're serving the military. What's the backbone of the military? The NCOs. The backbone of the military, the NCOs. What's the backbone of America? Small business entrepreneurs. So now, if I had to find leadership in the business world and you said, hey, David, CEOs at the corporations? Nope, not interested. They're corporate men. They're followers. They're globalists. Or a private business owner. He still could be rich. Still could be a millionaire. But, you know, whatever. His business, 100 people, 1,000 people, maybe 10, but private. Private business owners. Leadership in the military. I don't have much faith in the officer corps. I'd probably say get NCO, special operations guys. Get those guys. They're more leadership because you know as well as I do. I've seen it. These officers right now, career first, men second. They're corporate men. They, they, they go in there. They want to make general. And all of these military officers who all, all talk about courage under fire, like warrior leaders, my time in the military, when it came to their careers, these men's knees buckled, buckled when it came to their career. So again, leadership, the business world, and in the, and in the uh, military world, however, the corporate CEOs and these generals and admirals, they suck. They're corporates. I'd probably say go to the NCOs, probably special operation guys, or go to the private business leaders. And I think that's where our military is, is diminishing because I witnessed it on my way out. Like guys were prioritizing their careers over taking care of soldiers and when soldiers aren't being taken care of, that's why we, this whole military recruiting crisis, like guys are just not being taken care of. Morale is shit because everybody's thinking about their career and how they get the next rank and guys are just not being taken care of. And it just blows my mind because we're at the point now where like our military is probably the shittiest that it's ever been. And it's fucking sad because it's not going to get any worse. And I always tell people like America is still... Like, pe people want us to fail all around the world. And if the military goes to shit, like, we're in a world of hurt. Uh, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the military. People don't understand. We're the Roman Empire. We're going to collapse economically. People ask me, David, 
Why hasn't the U.S. dollar collapsed already? It's very simple. When President Nixon took the gold, took the U.S. dollar off the gold standard, people still believed in the U.S. dollar, even though it's, it's a fiat currency. And all fiat currencies eventually go under. We replaced the gold, we replaced the U.S. dollar backed by gold by the U.S. dollar backed by the United States military. We still have, on paper at least, the most powerful military in the world. People still fear us, respect us. Once our military is over, and it's going to get over fast, this U.S. dollar is done. It's done. But that's when people ask me, what is backing the U.S. dollar now? It's called tanks, aircraft carriers, F-16, soldiers, army rangers, whatever you want to call it. That's what's backing it. But our military has been degrading for decades. How any military officer could have, we'll just say, you know, the, the campaign in Afghanistan on his resume and be proud, as a West Point graduate, our mission is to win wars. We absolutely lost in Afghanistan. We didn't even know the mission. But guess who won in Afghanistan? Guess who won in Iraq? The generals, because they got their promotions. The military industrial complex, they got their bonuses and their, and their new yachts and houses. And the corrupt politicians who got their kickbacks, their reelections, and their insider trading to the military industrial complex stocks. So they won because the mission of the military industrial complex is not to win a war, not to lose a war, just keep them going. Just keep these wars going. But how any West Point, I think these West Point generals suck. Petraeus, McChrystal, these guys suck. How any West Point general could have Afghanistan on his resume and be proud of it, it's a joke. We know this. And once our military collapses, that is the end of the U.S. dollar, people. That is the end. And it's going to come fast. Yeah, and that's uh, unfortunate. But uh, why don't we jump right into your story, uh, David, as far as what happened to you um, and why you're no longer welcome back to the United States. And then we'll uh, go from there. Yeah, sure. So let me tell this quick story to put teeth on it. What I'm about to say, it's in my book. It's documented. The congressmen and senators know this. My last time I traveled back to America was in 2019. I was on a plane from Taiwan to Chicago. Again, everything I'm saying is document, documented. Even there's a Freedom of Information Act request from the DHS. You're not going to get anything from the FBI, but even records from the Department of Homeland Security. So everything's documented. Here's the story. August 2019, I'm on a plane, Taiwan to Chicago. Most of the people on the plane are foreigners. We land in Chicago, we go through customs, and they, they're allowed into America doing whatever they got to do. Me, military veteran, American citizen, I get, uh, I get selected for secondary screening. And before I tell my story, I'll say real quick, why am I not welcome? My story includes detained, searched, interrogated, covertly surveilled, lied to, humiliated, and physically assaulted. If these things happen to you when you travel to a foreign country, I don't think you're going to go there anymore. That's as unwelcome as can be. So back to my story. I'm at the airport. I get, se I get selected for secondary screening. And now the police, and trust me, I think the police suck. I don't back the blue. Don't back. I back strong men with guns, the Second Amendment. That's who I back. I think the, I think the police have gone way too far. I get selected for secondary screening. This is Customs and Border Patrol. They begin to interrogate me. And of course, when you don't answer the police, they think you're hiding, this and that. And of course, it's your constitutional right to remain silent. But if you ask, like I did, why did you detain me? What is this about? What are you searching me for? They don't like to give any questions. I have to surrender all my digital equipment, computer, phone. I have to give them my password. Otherwise, they'll, they'll confiscate it. And these devices, as we know, a lot of information on these devices, it goes back into a, into a, you know, a secret room. This is in the airport. I'm waiting for about three hours. They go through everything. Go through all my stuff, count all my money. What are you doing? Interrogation. Finally, I told them enough time. I have nothing to say. Leave me alone. I, I've no, I, stop bothering me. I finally wait till all my stuff is back. It's about three hours now, and I'm finally allowed to leave. So that's my first welcome back in America. Detained, searched, interrogated story continues and oh by the way i didn't tell him what i was doing there go to my rumble episode one two three i'm suing the boeing corporation this story's nuts 
I worked for the Boeing Corporation, the military industrial complex in China. I was in Chicago because Boeing is headquartered in Seattle, but they're registered in, in Chicago. I'm doing a deposition against the Boeing defense team. I'm suing them. Anyway, I'm in the city of Chicago. I'm only there for three days. It's my second day. I feel like I'm under surveillance. I just know it. I'm under surveillance. I, again, everything I'm telling you is recorded. Your congressmen and senators who are scumbags, they have it. They're ignoring me. I go to Grant Park. I'm in Grant Park, and I notice a man surreptitiously taking pictures of me. Surreptitiously. The man is located about 50 meters away. I describe him. White guy, five foot nine, khaki shorts, blue polo shirt, cropped hair, describe everything. And this person is surreptitiously, basically stalking me is another word, but very surreptitiously. You're not quite sure. I have no doubt that this person is an FBI employee, either a special agent or what we call, we call an, uh, a surveillance operative. Either way, an FBI employee. I'm shocked. Don't know what to do. This person's surveilling me. I decide to turn in the park and go on basically a dead run for about 100 meters. I mean, I'm out of breath and I'm going through nooks and crannies in the park, left and right, all this stuff. I go to a dead end L shaped in the park. I stop. I turn around. This same man is in a dead pursuit after me. As soon as, as, soon as he turns the corner and sees me, he's shocked because he knows he's been burned. I'm looking at him. He knows it now that I know he's surveilling me. I'm looking right at him. He goes from a run to a jog to a walk because he's huffing and puffing too. His eyes are wide and he's shocked. What's about to happen, 100%, he never put in his FBI report. He's pissed off. His fists are bawling, opening close. He's walking to me. It's a surreal moment. I don't even know what to do, but the only thing I can think of is to de-escalate the situation, something that law enforcement is retarded. They don't know how to de-escalate. They usually do the opposite. And again, I know this person's FBI without a doubt. Uh, all, the only thing I think of doing is I put my body in a very relaxed stance. I'm not in a fighting stance purposely, so I'm very relaxed. And I just put out my hand at a 90-degree angle like to shake someone's hand. It's the only thing I think is he's walking towards me. Right before he shakes my hand, this is the, the lying part, I ask him. I said, are you following me? You could tell he's pissed off. He's like, no, it's an absolute lie. He then shakes my hand. He's trying to squeeze it, trying to break it, trying. And then I asked him the second question. I said, you wouldn't lie to me, would you? Now he's pissed off. He's like, no. At that time, he rotates his, uh, his elbow. I'm tall. I'm six foot five. So he's five foot nine. So, you know, there's obviously a height difference. He elbows me in my solar plex, shoulders me in my chest so hard. I almost fall down. He almost fall down. And we spin 180 degrees. Now we're in 180 degrees. We're now about, because he lost his grip after he hit me, we're about, I don't know, two meters apart. Around. The grip is done. I know this person's FBI. You don't want to get into any physical altercation with this. And it's surreal. We end up looking at each other for anywhere from three seconds, maybe 10 seconds. I can't tell, but it was surreal. The only thing I could think of is summon my military command boys. I use my knife hand and I shout loud. Stop. I turn around. Now I'm facing in my original direction and I run for it. This time I turn around. Same guy. Now it's obvious. I mean, he's running now only five meters behind me. He's shouting on the phone. He's got a phone. He's shouting direction. I go through oncoming traffic. We're in the city of Chicago. I could have been killed. Oncoming traffic, you know, through red lights. You know, talk about seer school escape and evade for literally three hours through the city escape and evade i'm thinking i'm being hunted by my own government then the very next day so at that time i feel like i I've, I've lost the tail you know i feel like now i'm not being surveilled this is my own country here i get i get treated better in foreign countries now it's time to leave the airport so again what happened in the airport is documented it's redacted because at the airport is dhs now I'm about to leave. I'm about to fly back to Taiwan. You tell me, American citizens, if this is odd. I go through, uh, you know, customs. I'm ready to board the, the flight. Everything's normal. We're in the, you know, the waiting area of the gate. You know, whatever. There's like 200, 300 people. I can't tell. It's, you know, we're about to board this airplane. And the flight attendant says, you know, we're about to begin boarding. Rows, you know, one through this, stand up. And 
just like in any airport, everyone stands up, we have a line, and we're, we're, we're going to board the plane. And, you know, sometimes you got to go through one corridor to the next corridor. And the last corridor is, you know, where you see the plane, the oval opening, and the stewardess is at the door checking tickets. As we cleaned up, there are two uniformed Customs and Border Patrol agents inspecting passports of everyone. Now, again, we're, we're past customs. This is not normal. We're, we're, it's just ready to get on board. They're inspecting passports. Everything's fine. Everyone's going. I get there. Mr. Baumblatt, please step over here. To the American people, this is, again, another you know, detainment, search, interrogation. But this is the humiliation part. Me, as a military veteran, I like to break their jaws, what these guys did to me. This is humiliating. They said, step over here. Now, remember, in a line, there's no over there. There's no, like, private room. There's not, we're basically in a corridor. So what happens? Everybody sees this on the plane, like the people that are lined up. I'm only about two, maybe three feet away from the line. Everyone's walking by. And I said, well, what do you want? They said, we need to go through all your stuff and everything. I said, well, what do you want me to do? There's no table. There's no chairs. They said, sit on the ground. Yeah, I'm a grown man. I'm almost 50 years old. I sit on the ground. I said, why? Take off your shoes. They took out the soles of my feet, undo the laces, stood me up, patted my crotch. I even asked, I said, what are you looking for? Of course. They're interrogating me. What is your purpose in Chicago? Like, I'm an American citizen. I need a purpose to come to America. Where were you staying? What hotels? What are your contacts? What are your political views? Again, this, is, this entire investigation is about my political views. Everyone knows it from, I'm kind of, you could say, a far-right Trump supporter, whatever you want. We'll get into it. But there's no evidence of illegal activity. They go through all of it. This is how intrusive it is. I have a notebook. They go through the notebook. They're taking pictures of everything. There's a phone number. They take a picture. They said, who does this phone number belong to? None of your business. He pulls out his phone. Don't worry. We're going to find out. Now they're starting to intimidate me. Why aren't you answering our questions? Of course, I asked them, what are you searching for? Why am I being? All these people, again, we're flying back to Taiwan. All, all, almost all of them are foreign nationals. So the foreign nationals, they get a free pass. But the American citizen, I'm humiliated, detained, and they're not telling me, why are you doing this? No. Nope. Now... The whole flight is boarded. The stewardess at that door, she has direct line of sight to me. We're about, I'd say, 10 meters away. Again, we're just in a passageway. And they're still continuing to intimidate me. Hey, if you miss your flight, you miss your flight. We're going to elevate this to high. And I kept saying, what do you want? Why are you detained? Then they want more information from me. The flight attendant motions to the, there are two of them, Customs and Border Patrol. These are uniform guys. She's like, listen, what's going on? Because we got to go. Is, is this guy me? Is he going on or off? And so they're looking at me pissed off because they didn't find whatever they're looking for. And I'm asking, what are you looking for? I mean, it's getting, it's getting hostile now. Finally, the flight attendant says, last call. We, we have to close the door. So they look at me pissed off as if they didn't find their fortune cookie. And they're like, fine, you can go. And I'm thinking, yeah, go fuck yourself. I'm never coming back to this country. I get on board, the flight attendant you know, politely grabs me, but she's like, we got to get you your seat now. Everybody is looking at me because they're like, oh, isn't that that drug dealer or terrorist who's about to get arrested? Like, well, why, is he on the, why is he on the plane? He looked like he was about to get arrested. As soon as I sit down, we take off. Meaning the whole plane was waiting on me. Now, to the American people, if you are detained, searched, interrogated, overtly surveilled, humiliated, lied to, and physically assaulted, tell me, are you welcome back in your own country? Now, I did a Freedom of Information Act request to the DHS, because you're not going to get anything from the FBI. And I said, why did you do this? What happened? So that's documented both into and out of Chicago that I was detained. A lot of it is redacted, but the key question is, why? Well, there is a clause. And the clause states that if this is a national security investigation, this is from the FBI, then the DHS is under no obligation to tell you the reason why. So there's, there's no reason that they gave me uh, that, that, you know, uh, meaning why was I detained and all this stuff. Now, what happened in Grand Park, the surveillance, well, the scumbag FBI, they're never going to admit it. That person was 100% FBI, physically assaulted, surveilled. To the American people, I've got four master's degrees. I'm an educated person. I'm telling you, America, you better start learning German because America... East Germany, the Stasi, 
that's the FBI. That's your future. <laughs> yeah, I can uh I can tell you right now you're definitely in Savell cuz uh you know, going through training, like one thing they do teach us is never pissed off the surveillance guys. <laughs> and what you did there with the evasive maneuvers just to identify them clearly, uh that's exactly what that was. And I, I shit, it probably pissed them off cuz they had to scramble uh, scramble and come out of their fucking postures just so they can chase you. Um, and when they did, they fucking let you know that um, they're not too happy with you. Now, let's go into why the FBI is surveilling you and why they have beef with you. Why don't you go into that story to try to paint the picture? Sure. So now there are other FBI whistleblowers out there. You've heard about them. I am not necessarily like them. They're doing good work and they're helping me out because, like I said, one of the reasons I never went public in 2007, I don't think it wouldn't believe me. People believe in the FBI. So now other people are coming out saying, yeah, the FBI's corrupt. So good for them. But we're not the same. And here's why. There's very, first of all, there's very few people who quit the FBI. I was never fired. I mean, to get fired from the government, the FBI, I mean, you got to do something. So it, just by me quitting the FBI, because it was weird. I was warned about this from an F, from a West Point graduate who's a senior FBI guy in the FBI. He found out I was leaving the FBI. He warned me. He's like, David, this ain't like the military. You know, like when I did my five years of service, people, you know, people don't expect you to do 20 years. You could do 20 years. You don't do 20 years. You do, you know, whatever. You, you come and go. It's, it's your free world. The FBI has like a 99% retention rate. They make good money. I mean, a field agent makes about $130,000. Uh, a management will make over $150,000, $200,000. It's, it's a good life. I mean, you can't get fired. So they have a 99% retention rate. So just by the fact that I quit, they don't like it. And I, I don't think people understand the ego in the FBI. We joke about the Navy SEALs having an ego. Nothing compared to the FBI. So one is, I quit. They didn't like it. And I had some issues with management. Two, I wrote a letter to Senator Chuck Grassley, and I said about the abuses, what these whistleblowers are talking about, I already reported to, spying on American citizens. But I also ripped FBI management. It's, it's atrocious. Senator Chuck Grassley never responded to me. I guarantee he gave it to a staffer. Staffer gave it to the FBI. So I already have a lot of bad blood with the FBI. A lot of bad blood. Three, I moved to China. And I write in my report, the FBI will open up investigation on American citizen for anything. They don't care. So they don't like me. I go to China. But what really clicked when I left America, I wasn't. And again, I never badmouth the FBI because it's just not leadership. It's not. It's like getting a divorce. You know, I know you don't like her. She doesn't like you, but just go on your way. So I never said anything bad about the FBI because no one wants to listen to a complainer. So I was fine. When I'm overseas, this would have been 2000, whenever Trump ran for president, I guess 2016 or 15, whenever he went down the escalator and he said, I'm going to run for president. Now I'm overseas and I'm in these chat groups, WeChat, Telegram, WhatsApp, email groups, mostly military guys. It's about 80% American, 20% Brits, Australian. Most of them are officers, West Pointers, Annapolis, Sandhurst. Truth be told, it's a guy's group. We just talk about girls and career and just, it's a guy group. When Trump decided to run for president, that was a big topic. And the reason it was a big topic was I was even shocked. The group was split, meaning half of them were pro Trump, half of them were against Trump. Even the ones that were pro Trump, I was obviously pro Trump, that was split into half that they were the reluctant Trump supporters. Like, yeah, I know he's a racist. I don't want to support him, but I have to because I'm a Republican, like those guys. And then, yeah, me, I love him. And so we started going back and forth. It, it started getting hot. And at that time, I never before vocalized it, but I started vocalizing. I said, you don't know how bad America is going to get. We're going to get to civil war. We're going to get to a revolution, this and this and this. And I could caveat this with the FBI when they designate domestic, or I guess I'd be considered an international terrorist, is you don't realize how low the standard is, unlike criminal. We we'll could get into it later if you want to understand how the FBI works. During this time, though, so I'm very vocal. So this is what I'm thinking what they really launched their investigation on. About a year later, when Trump won, 
and I'm pissing off people. I mean, I mean, I I had a lot of West Point friendships that break up. You probably know, you know, the whole Trump thing. Friendships were broken, stuff like that. You know, it gets personal, whatever. At that time, when Trump uh, won, I got people, friends, close friends, who started contacting me out of the blue, or close friends. Come to find out. The FBI was recruiting sources to spy on me. Some of these were scumbag West Pointers, close friends, older, younger grads, obviously from human intelligence to recruit sources. You got to get people close to, you. you know, you don't recruit their enemy. So these were close people into the military out. And these conversations that were private conversations, this is a bit of entrapment. Now, during these conversations that were private, did I say some stuff that was pretty hyperbolic? Everything from there could have been racism, anything from, you know, destroy America, kill these motherfuckers. I mean, private conversations, you let your guard down. And I probably said some stuff looking back that, yeah, that was a little bit too much. But again, you're talking to your friends. That information alone to the FBI designated as some type of sedition, anti-government, because you got to understand the same reason why I say I'm a national security threat. It sounds so hyperbolic in Hollywood. It's not. I'm going to explain it. I am under a national security investigation by the FBI because they think I'm a threat. So I'm a national security threat. Now, sound hyperbolic? Let's go to January 6th. You have a middle-aged, tax-paying, law-abiding citizen who illegally trespassed into the Capitol building. Guess what? The FBI lost a launched a national security investigation into these people because they're domestic terrorism. Welcome to East Germany, the Stasi. Meaning, it is easier for the FBI to allege that you're a spy or a terrorist than the criminal stance than you're a drug dealer or a bank robber. You know, if you're a bank robber, the, the FBI is going to need some evidence. You know, where's the money? Where's the bank? You know, you're going to need some evidence. But today's FBI, you're a spy or you're a terrorist, meaning national security, you would be amazed on how low, and I, this is what I wrote, Senator Chuck Grassley, I said this is very dangerous, how low the bar is for the FBI to allege that you're some type of anti-sedition, white supremacist, take down the government, and you're under a national security investigation because they think you are a national security threat. The difference between me is, the FBI went way too far with me. And there's more to my story, how much they damaged me. And also, because I'm located overseas, it was harder for them to investigate me. So they showed their hand more. But if you're located in America, you're probably never going to know. I mean, it is, the FBI has so much power and tools to spy on you if you're living in America that it's going to be almost impossible for you to find out that the FBI is spying on you. But because I'm located overseas, they had to do some extraordinary measures to spy on me, and they showed their hand. But enough is enough. And anyone who doesn't believe my story, then watch this. I'm a military veteran. I serve my country. Why isn't one congressman or senator put their name on a piece of paper saying, we think David's story is a lie. We don't believe him. But to totally ignore me by our entire government, FBI, you know something's up. They're hiding. But you don't ignore a military veteran. You take my allegation, you investigate, and then you think, is it substantiated or not? But every single congressman and senator, and now I'm censored on YouTube, censored on Twitter, something's going on. They don't want my story out because I'm telling you, the FBI went way too far. Now, as far as um, getting this ironed out, did you reach out to the FBI at all to try to get this fixed? So what I'm about to tell you is, again, all recorded. This is all recorded. It's in my book. It's in, uh, oh, and by the way, the book that I wrote, that's unauthorized. When you write a book from the intelligence world, you have to get authorization. Why didn't I get the FBI's authorization? Because they're ignoring me. Let me tell you this story. This is documented. This is January of 2020, you know, right before the COVID hit. I am in Beijing, China. I arranged a meeting with the FBI legal attache and assistant legal. Most people don't know, but we have FBI stationed in U.S. embassies abroad. So at the U.S. embassy Beijing, 
There's a FBI Liga and an FBI ALAT. These are managerial positions. I actually knew one of the guys. I never met the other guy, and we had a meeting. Everything's recorded. Two FBI guys in Maine. They said, David, we're at the meeting. What's the purpose of this meeting? And I made it crystal clear. Three reasons. Reason number one, I'm under investigation by the FBI. 100%. Two, stop immediately. Three, grab your balls, because I'm telling you, these guys, there is so much low testosterone in the FBI, you'd be amazed. I mean, I'm the, I'm the, I, was the, uh, co I was the heavyweight co-captain of the West Point boxing team, all-army boxer. I've got probably more testosterone now than most 25-year-old kids in America. If you think the FBI is filled with alpha males, high testosterone, you're crazy. These are weak men, weak. And I said, be a man. Stop spying on me behind my back like little boys. That's why no one respects you. Be a man, face me man to man, and level the allegations. They replied to me, David, we have no clue what you're talking about. That's fine. I'll take them on their word for that. But guess who knows? FBI headquarters. You send a report to FBI headquarters of this meeting, and you get their answer because they know. This is all recorded. FBI responds, and what, is, what does the FBI do? Doesn't confirm, doesn't deny, totally. Then, this is my official allegation, everything's official. When I sent the official allegation to the congressmen and senators, I also sent it up, and I, and I got read receipts, not just read receipts, email receipts from the FBI head of ethics. I even, I, in another video, I'll show her name and everything like that. She's, a, she's FBI assistant director, but she's got a public name, public face. She even replied, David, we have your... Uh, uh, you know, it was a whistleblower allegations. We have it. And I don't know, I guess they're working on it. This has like been three years ago. So then I sent it to the FBI, the, um, the inspector general for the DOJ, and then the uh, congressman centers. But I'm telling you, anyone who knows my story, that's why I eventually had to write a book. 100%. The FBI knows about this. They are, they are avoiding me like little boys. We could go into it. The congressman and center. So that's the key. If anyone thinks my story, it's kind of like this. If a woman alleges rape and you're like, I think that's a bullshit story. And there are. There's a lot of women date rape. It's, it's bullshit. But still, she still should be afforded with an interview with a policeman. And if that policeman thinks there's no evidence to open up investigation, then that detective needs to put his name down on a piece of paper that says, I'm Detective Boundblood. I listened to the alleged victim. I don't think there's a case, so I'll take responsibility of it. That's my point. Anyone who doesn't believe my story, I am still entitled as a military veteran American citizen for a congressman center, or it should have been done by the inspector general for the, for the Department of Justice. Because the FBI is corrupt. They're not, they're not going to do anything. For someone to say, all right, David, we're going to at least do a preliminary investigation, interview you, and see. And then if they did it and put their name down that said they think my story's fake, that changes the story, but you don't totally ignore. And to the American men out there, this government is ignoring me. It's a microcosm. So when this country goes into war and they need a draft and all of a sudden you're important now, now you're important. Hey, we need you eat shit. That's what I tell the American government. You don't, you have no, no care in the world to answer to me, ignore me. That's fine. When you need live American boys to be dead soldiers, then you could count me out. I'll ignore you too. Now you mentioned that they showed their hands because you were overseas. Could you elaborate on that? So yeah, and there's 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 more to this. I'm not going to tell everything, but to the American people, this is the straw that broke the camel's back. If the investigation with the FBI stayed domestically, I wouldn't have went public. I, and and I tell this too to Senator Chuck Grassley, going up. A, the FBI is the most powerful agency in America. People don't realize. They think CIA. Because it's law enforcement, intelligence, don't mess with the FBI. So if it would have stayed domestically, I would have never went back to America, and I would have never went public. And I just said, fuck it. I guess I'm never going to go back to America, and I, and, I, and I would stay quiet. Then they went overseas. This is what happened. I'm not going to give all the details for a reason, but there's proof. You, you'll have it. I, uh, if you go to my Rumble, because again, I'm censored on YouTube. If you go to my Rumble episode three, I work for Amazon, this corrupt globalist corporation in China. So I work for both Boeing and Amazon in China. 
During the COVID, I left China. It was horrendous, the lockdowns. I moved to a Western-friendly country. I'm not going to give the name now for good reasons. You'll understand. I'm not going to. But it was a Western-friendly country. You know, it's not Russia. It's not China. And the reason that people know that it's Western-friendly is because the FBI could never get away with what I'm about to say if I was in China, Russia, because they don't have, you know, they don't have influence. But the FBI, which is the world's police, oh, if you're in a Western country, oh, the FBI has a lot of power. So I'm in this Western country and I'm working on becoming a citizen. I've got my work visa, my career, my family, everything. And I'm going to, because again, America is going to collapse. I'm in this country and I said, this country is going to be my home. I'm going to become a citizen. I have my work, everything. And I was never doing anything illegal. All of a sudden, out of the blue, I'm kicked out of this country. And I am never, ever allowed for the rest of my life to ever apply again for a work visa in this country. Me, the FBI destroyed my career. This is the third time, and we'll go into it if you want in America. What did the FBI do? Well, let's do reverse engineering when I was in the FBI. Picture this scenario of if I'm in the FBI, and this is exactly what happened. We're in America, we're in the FBI. We get a call from a friendly intelligence agency because it's got to be friendly. That's why I was in a Western friendly country. So the FBI has good relations. We're going to say France, which even though France is a little bit in the gray area sometimes, but generally they're, they're, they're our NATO allies. They're a friendly country. So let's just say France. The French intelligence agency out of the blue contacts the FBI. It says, FBI, there is a French national in your country, the, the, Ameri the United States of America, and we want to know what he's doing, who's his contacts, uh, what is his political motive, they, all these questions. Now, the FBI, we immediately go to a red flag. And oh, by the way, the FBI, we don't know all foreigners living in America. It's too many, it's too hard, we don't know. But if the French intelligence agency tells us about a French national and asks all these questions, that's a red flag and that's an investigation. And of course, we'd ask the French intelligence agency, please provide us with all the details. Maybe they will, maybe they won't because they, you know, everything's compartmentalized, but they say, we need to know this person is a person of importance. So we know something bad is going on. We would launch a clandestine operation against this French national in America. It could go on for a year or more. Now, during this investigation, we find out that this French national is not doing anything illegal. Because let's use common sense. If I was doing something illegal in that country, I could be in jail. But my life was put in danger. Why? Because when the FBI investigates this French national, if he finds out, you know, it can intimidate you. Anyone, you know, anyone in America, especially if you're a foreign national, knows that you're being investigated by the FBI, you're going to start getting porn, paranoia. Uh, uh, paranoia. <laughs> you're going to be squared. You're going to get scared. And, um, but after the investigation with the FBI, we realized that this French national has not done anything wrong. Well, what do you do? Well, the person's not a U.S. citizen. He's a foreign national. And better safe than sorry. This is national security. We would contact ICE and we'd say, we're FBI. Hi, ICE. You've got this French citizen on a work visa here. Cancel it immediately. Don't tell them the reason why and kick them out. And then the French national, like May, will get something in the mail or email saying, we're sorry, but um, in two weeks, your visa is expired. You have two weeks to get out of this country. And the French, well, French national, why? What happened? Sorry, uh, just, you know, can't say anything. Two weeks, get the fuck out. And oh, by the way, for the rest of your life, you are never allowed to come to America uh, again. That's what happened to me. That's my own government. And I'm telling to the American people, I say again, you think China, Russia, the Taliban, remember Saddam Hussein, we assassinated him. You start worrying about these threats, you have no clue. The biggest threat that's going to take away your faith your family and your freedom is this corrupt globalist American government and these corporations. The FBI, as far as I'm concerned, is enemy 101. And we could talk about it more in my feelings of the FBI. But that was the straw that broke the camel. That was the second time my career was destroyed by the FBI. The second time after I left the FBI. That's what I'm saying. I'm not a whistleblower like the FBI. 
They're called the suspendables. They're, I was never suspended. I quit. We're talking two jobs in the civilian world. Destroyed, and they'll never stop. The FBI will never stop. And then I said, I got, as you can know, I was in a rage. I, I mean, I would like to do a hand-to-hand to the death match with these FBI. Just fucking to the death. Hand-to-hand, no hold far to the death. But then I said, I'm going public because I'm being ignored. That was the impetus for it. And what did my government do when I went public? Well, if you watch episode one, you'll find out what controversy I said. Don't know, but that video got censored. I mean, and I've got proof on that, how it was censored on YouTube. But so then I go public, and what did my own country do? Censor me. And you think I'm going to fight in any more of these wars for this government? Let this government collapse, and I'll, and I'll open up a champagne bottle. Now, all of this over whatever was taking place in that group thread. Now, you mentioned that they recruited like fellow West Pointers to spy on you. Have you spoken with those West Pointers? Do you have proof of this? Like, what were their feedback to you? Because when I think of military, we're supposed to be close knit, right? Brothers in arms. Exactly. Well, one, one thing I could say is this. First of all, to those who um, came to my aid, Obviously, I'm going to conceal their identity. I don't want them in trouble. And so I'm not going to talk about who, who, or what, what. Money was given, though. The FBI paid them money to spy on me and trap me. But this is what I'm going to tell the American public. If you think the military is full of this brotherhood, or the FBI is like the old days G-men, I'm going to tell the American people why you're communist for many reasons. And this relates to the military, this brotherhood, the FBI, we're losing it. There is this communist propaganda that has been indoctrinated in Americans for decades now. It is called diversity is our strength, or diversity is our strength. We repeat it like parents. And you need to ask people, where did you learn that? You didn't learn it from China. You didn't learn it from Russia. I'm telling you. We regurgitate this communist propaganda every day. And that diversity has now infected decades ago the military, the FBI. But you cannot have leadership 101. You cannot have unity, brotherhood. That's one of the reasons I joined the FBI. I wanted that elite brotherhood. Same thing. It's gone. People, it's gone. But you cannot have unity and diversity at the same time. They're mutually inexclusive. So we're constantly saying, hey, Americans, we need to unite. We need to come together. And then at the same time, we want more diversity. We want more diversity. You can't have it back and forth. But if you think our military is filled with this big brotherhood, you're crazy. Because you got to remember my story about when Trump ran for president. They were all military guys. That group was split, split hard. And it's split hard ideology. But I would say our military and our government, communist, socialist, you name it, it is the same. We wanted more and more diversity, and this is what we get. So how do we fix this? How do we keep your premonition from coming true? Like, how do we make men men again? How do we avoid this, this civil unrest? Because I see it too, as far as these, the, the force diversity, not only within the ranks of special operations, but within the military. It's like, dude, if the guy can do the job, let him do it. But don't force it on anybody. You know what I mean? But it's, it's going on everywhere. Everybody gets a trophy, right? And all that does is it, it makes us fucking weak. Like, how do we, one, fix the military industrial complex problem? the corporations from running shit and this country from being on the verge of civil war? Like, how do we fix all those things? What I would say is sometimes the situation is so bad that it's going down. So what I want to do, and this is why the FBI is also investigating me, and this is this. People say, David, how do we fix the problem? One of the, one of the options, though, again, I was kicked off Twitter, possibly there could be a peaceful separation in America. But I think we're going to go to violence. But here's my point. Never forget that America was formed through a revolution. At West Point, 
Right in front of the mess hall at West Point is a statue of George Washington, General President George Washington. You walk by this statue every day at West Point. And George Washington is a hero, and he should be. He's, a found, he's one of the founding fathers of America. But never forget, our founding fathers, if they lost the war, they would have been hung as traitors. But they formed America through violence, through illegal activity, and that's how America was formed. And oh, by the way, America's foreign policy, how, you know, what is our foreign policy with other countries? Violence, treachery, intelligence. So, you know, we have to make sure we know you, violence is everywhere. You know, you get the typical American like, I don't want to look at violence, but, you know, they love boxing. They love UFC. They like seeing a big war. They're like, oh, yeah, let's bomb, you know, Russia. Let's bomb. So, you know, we are a violent country. So to all of a sudden say, we've got to avoid violence at all costs. Well, America would have never been formed, number one, if violence was. Uh, but I would say this. Ask yourself this one question or this one word. It's called freedom. We know that America is getting more and more inundated with laws, regulations, and policy, and we're losing our freedom. And the reason is, is if America had more freedoms, we would split apart. Meaning what I'm saying is America as a whole is being artificially held together. We don't even want to be anymore. We, we, a lot of people, they just want to be left alone and separated. So if we were ever granted freedom, you'll see many of the states succeed. So to answer your question, how do we fix this? Sometimes it may have to get worse before it gets better. And I say again, I don't believe America is a country anymore. It's a corporation. And this bank, the U.S. dollar, it's going gonna, it's gonna to collapse. So I would just say prepare for the worst, you know, and get ready. But I would say, you know, looking at you now, most people don't know the history of the, uh, the OSS intelligence, especially the, the background of the FBI, why Jed Hoover didn't like the CIA. The first CIA agents were all FBI. But what relates to this story and you as a Green Beret is this. When the Office of Strategic Services, the OSS, was disbanded after World War II, people believe it formulated the CIA. That's not totally correct. It split off into two branches, a civilian uh, part and a military part. The civilian part were CIA. In fact, the first CIA officers were FBI agents overseas, changed their badges. That's why J. Edgar Hoover was pissed off. But then there was a military component. And what was that? Special Green Forces Berets. Green Berets. So, you know, you look at the Navy SEALs. The Navy SEALs are more like a military SWAT team. But a Green Beret, 50% of a job in a Green Beret may not have to do with a rifle. You know, you're sometimes like a Peace Corps officer with a gun. Intelligence building. Intelligence gathering. A little bit more. That's why the Green Berets are technically known to be more mature. They're looked upon as they want more maturity, more intelligence. But to the American people... Well, what I say right now, if there was ever a time I would want to befriend an American Green Beret who's hopefully a patriot, now's the time. Because what you're going to want to do as this American government becomes more and more tyrannical, just how the Green Berets assess their mission overseas, you're going to start seeing Green Berets in America thinking, I keep getting these calls from these militias asking for help. I never thought I'd do it, but... I'm now contemplating helping out these militias, but you're going to need to go to Green Berets. And who are the Green Berets up against? Well, the FBI. They're the FBI. They are the domestic secret police that are going to be searching out the Green Berets. So just what we do overseas, it's going to happen in America. You're going to, because you got to remember, I'm different than most people. I had this conversation in 2010, and what did people say? David, you're a moron. You're crazy. America will never collapse. We're going to be the... Now, 14 years later, people are starting to think, you give it more time. This ship is sinking. It's going to get worse. When was the last time you came to the U.S. for a visit? Was it after that, that Chicago incident? That was it. So 2019, I mean, after that, you know, and of course, I immediately communicated the FBI, this and that. But no, I mean, I, again, to the American people, this is great. I'm going I'm to military veteran American citizen. I get treated better in foreign countries than my own country. You would think a congressman and senator would say, yeah, this is odd. Let, let, let's have a talk. Let, 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 let's see it. Then to be totally ignored, forget it. The only good thing about my situation is 
I don't pay any U.S. taxes. I refuse, even though I'm legally uh, uh, obliged to, even as a U.S. citizen abroad, I'm still supposed to pay U.S. taxes. I don't pay any U.S. taxes. I'm not going to feed this machine. Gotcha, gotcha. Now, as far as the the United States itself, would you ever come back? Or is it one of those things that you're just going to sit by and uh, watch the show and then just go from there? It's weird you mention that. I was telling my West Point friends that my plan was to leave. And I wasn't, you know, I wasn't angry. I was not. But I said, dude, I'm going to be abroad. When the Civil War collapse happens, I'm going to be eating my genetically modified organisms popcorn, thanks to Monsanto, and I'm going to watch the Communist News Network, CNN, and I'm going to watch this Civil War take place. But I'm going to stay out of it. But now with this investigation to me, I never imagined that I'd be sort of back in, in, in the public sphere. But if you ask me, there's only one war that I'd be interested in fighting. That's a Civil War. I'm not in Ukraine. Israel, Afghanistan, or uh, or Taiwan, I'm not dying for any of these people. A civil war in America, I'd lock and load. That would be something I'd be interested in. But I'm not interested in being any more of a, uh, you know, one of these government yo-yos, you know, going to these wars and fighting because you just look at them. They're, they're, and we could go into them, but they've been absolutely, you know, we're not only the bully overseas, but we can't even win. It would be at least better to say, hey, we're the bully, but we win. We're the bully and we can't even win because it's getting to the point, and I, I'm going to push this back on special operations, guys. I'm actually tired of hearing their stories about there I was killing the Taliban, there I was killing the Iraqis for two reasons. One, gentlemen, you're not adding value to the American people anymore. There's a lot of taxes. People are hurting in America. They're, they're, you know, they're having trouble putting food on the table. You know, these Taliban, these Iraq, I don't care about them. I really don't care about them. And, 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 and who cares? But, and number two is this. It looks like a bully. I mean, I mean, how much money did these Taliban, I mean, these aren't first world, you know, tier one operators. I mean, all of the money that's spent on our U.S. military. I mean, we send in the kitchen sink. If Hollywood was located in these other countries, you probably could make some phenomenal war movies of the Taliban. You know, there I was in sandals. I had no training, no supply, and there I am taking on the Army Rangers, and I won. I mean, it's an amazing thing. So it's kind of like we're, we're, we're Goliath, and we're taking on David. It's, it's gone too much. And again, I'm pro-military. Trust me. I, I want strong, strong military, but we've turned into a bully overseas, and we're not fighting for the American people. I mean, think about it. If you're a military veteran who says, I'm fighting for freedom, all right, what about freedom of speech? Do you not care about freedom of speech? Like I've been censored on YouTube. I mean, it, it's hurting my, my career and everything. So these military veterans, they care so much about the freedoms of these foreigners. Again, like Afghanistan, the girls in Afghanistan, they're like Sharia law. They can't go to college. I could care less. I could care less about these people. So how about we care about American citizens, their freedom, their way of life? So even the military, it's just the story, it's not helping, it's hurting. Meaning that at the end of the day, Americans are hurting so much. Telling these war stories about how you killed people overseas. Here I am, I'm a farmer in, in Iowa, you know, making barely making ends meet. Ooh, and I got to pay my tax money more and more to the American military that's blowing up. It's just not, it's gone too far. It's, that's not the purpose anymore. But don't fool yourself. I'm not a liberal hick. I believe in a strong military, but we've gone too far. Yeah, we need strong men, and uh, we need strong men in the military, and that's slowly uh, dwindling away. So, um, But yeah, David, I appreciate you coming on and sharing your story with us, man. If anybody wants to reach out to you, uh, where can they find you? The best one is Rumble. Just go to Rumble. Just put David Boundblood. You can also find me on Twitter. I've been suspended. I reversed my name, so now it's Boundblood David. So, you know, go there on Twitter and rumble because I'm really censored on everything else. Um, but that's it. If you want, you know, I have a book, an ebook, an audio book, stuff like that. And you can read the story. I appreciate it. And that's about it. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Hey, of course, man. Like I said, military men, like I'll never abandon anybody that's 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 served the military. And it definitely sounds like you've been or you're currently going through the ringer because I guess you're still overseas. Uh, one last question before I uh, we sign off. So were, were you stationed in China due to your job within the FBI or did you go there? Yeah. Yeah. So I was when I was with the FBI, I was domestically and we could talk on another episode about what I did. But when I left America in 2010, 
Then I moved to mainland China. I'm currently in Hong Kong, still China, but I'm currently in Hong Kong. But I say again, I know more about China and, and feel free. There's a lot of retardedness on the news from politics about China. Most people don't get China. And I'm talking CIA, FBI, Foreign Service, military, morons. They don't understand China. I know China more than anyone in the United States government. And that probably also makes the FBI feel very uncomfortable. It is what it is. It's freedom as it is. Again, I quit the FBI. I don't want anything more to do with them. And I'm not like the other whistleblowers. I was never suspended. I just quit. And, and if there's another episode, I could get into it more why I did. But the, the, the government is not filled with the best and brightest anymore. It's sad. It used to be. I think, that, I think if you're a guy with high testosterone, you're very intelligent, and you're willing to take risks, I think you're in the civilian world. Or the people that I grew up with were the military guys who were in and out. Like they said, I always wanted to be a ranger. I always wanted to be a SEAL. They did it and gone out. But I think a lot of these guys who make a career in government, the FBI, the CIA included, I call them government lackeys. I mean, they just, it's just, it's, they train to time, not the standard. So it, it is what it is. But I'm telling you, if you're finding someone about China, this is the guy. These people don't know what they're talking about. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, I appreciate you coming on, man, and sharing your story. Uh, and guys, if you got any questions for David, feel free to reach out to him on social media. Until next time, guys, take care of yourselves.